If you watched our video on why scientists should sometimes change all their variables at once, you know that one variable at a time, OVAT, optimization can be like trying to find the best pizza topping by only testing one at a time. Who likes ham pizza or pineapple pizza? But some think ham and pineapple pizza is magic. Or in my case, lately I've been eating a lot of chicken and bacon pizza. Don't knock it till you tried it. In that video, we talked about how response surface methods let you map out the whole landscape of your reaction conditions, finding optima that OVAT might stumble right past. Today, we're diving into a research paper that puts this into practice. The work was done by a graduate student, Gunnar Mitchum. He used response surface modeling to turbocharge a cross-coupling reaction, making two aryl paroles faster and with better yields, in some cases an order of magnitude faster. We'll walk through how he set up the optimization, why it works, and how you can get started on similar optimizations. The original reaction was developed by Joseph Siddiqui's group. We and a lot of other folks have used this reaction for years. It's general and works particularly well with electron-neutral or electron-deficient arenes. We've had problems with electron-rich arenes, but a little more on that later. The general reaction looks like this and is kind of a modified Nagishi coupling with in-situ generated zinc pyrrolide. A couple of different biphenylphosphines were used on palladium. One problem with methodology studies is that you can't fully optimize every substrate, not in one graduate career anyway. In the paper, Gunner picked three aryl bromides as models, mesotyl bromide, which is bulky and electron-rich, 4-bromo-NN dimethylaniline, so electron-rich with pi-donating nitrogen, and 1-bromo-3,5-bis trifluoromethyl benzene, which is electron-poor. Why these? They represent different personalities of substrates, sterically hindered, donating, or electron withdrawing, which might need tailored conditions. In other words, he optimized for archetypes that can be applied to similar compounds. What we'll be discussing is called a response surface. In these models, the thing you're looking at is called the response, Y, in the model. In this case, it will be the yield of the reaction. Then there are variables, which are the things that are being changed to look at the effect on the yield like the temperature or the amount of some reagent, the variables here will be given the symbol x in the model. The coefficients are called parameters, represented by letters, which give you an idea of how important a variable is to the yield. Here's a really simple model with three variables and one response to show you how these may be put together. In order to make sure the solution isn't depending on the raw size of the variable, you scale the variables from minus one to plus one. If you don't scale the variables, you can't compare the parameters in your model directly as they will scale with the natural size of your number. For example, if you're using, say, 0.1 to 0.8 millimoles of a reagent and using that as a variable, if you don't scale, then you could be comparing that with raw temperatures that run from 40 to 120 degrees C, orders of magnitude larger. You won't get a real feel for how the variables affect the reaction from the model without scaling. Here's an example for scaling. Let's say you have four temperatures in degrees Celsius, 20, 40, 60, 80. These raw temperatures are sometimes called the natural variables, and we'll give them symbol u. To get the scaled values, first you calculate the midpoint of the range of the variables, which just requires taking the average of the highest and lowest values. We'll call the midpoint of the ith variable u i naught. The other thing you need to calculate is the distance from the midpoint to the highest variable, so half the span. We'll call this delta ui. To calculate the scaled variable, which we'll just call x, use this equation. This will give your variables as a set of numbers from plus 1 to minus 1. A spreadsheet makes pretty quick work of this. If we apply this to our simple example with just four temperatures, 80, 60, 40, 20 degrees C, we get the ui naught value of 50 degrees C. We get a delta ui of 30 degrees C. Then that allows us to calculate the scaled values. Let's scale the 80 degree C value, which ends up being 80 minus 50 divided by 30, which is just 30 over 30, or plus 1. Just as another example, let's scale the 40 degree C value in the set. This uses 40 minus 50 over 30, which is negative 10 over 30, or negative 0.33. Here's a small table with all the values for this set. Back to Gunner's study. The first task is to identify what things in the reaction make a difference, what variables are worth studying. 
To figure this out, he ran some quick test reactions. He identified four key variables affecting yield. Temperature, zinc pyrrolide to aryl bromide ratio, the catalyst loading, and the time. These are your independent variables, the causes. Yield is the dependent variable, the effect or the response, as it's called in this method. Everything else, ligand, solvent, etc., is controlled. We'll talk about the model for the reaction to make two mesotyl parole here in some detail, and then we'll mention the results for the other two errorings. Obviously, way more detail can be found in the paper, which is linked in the description. After Sadigi, this reaction uses diterpbutyl biphenylphosphine, called Johnfoss. To map this four-variable space, he used a two-level full factorial design. For n variables, that's 2 to the n experiments, and here 2 to the 4 equals 16 runs. Two level means each variable gets a low, minus 1, and high, plus 1 value in scaled units, like this, and I'll show the middle just because we're going to use that later. If you're certain your response surface is flat, you just need the plus 1 and minus 1 values, and you run these 16 experiments to get the yields. Here is a table with those experiments. Think of them as points on a 4D hypercube, and you're running all the corners. Okay, maybe that's not all that easy to visualize, but that's what's happening. It's also just the complete list of plus one, minus one combinations if you have four variables. Also notice the pattern in the numbers. The first column has half plus one and then half minus one. The second column has a pattern of four plus ones and then four minus ones repeating. The third column has a pattern of two plus ones and two minus ones repeating. And the last column has alternating plus one, minus one. This data can be used to find all the parameters in a model with primary variables, just one kind of x by itself, and second order cross terms like x1, x2, or x3, x4. The, the model you start with would look like this with four variables. In order to find the parameters, you're doing some matrix algebra, linear regression. The equation for linear regression looks like this. The letters in bold, basically everything in this case, is a matrix of some size. If you don't know matrix algebra, that's okay. A matrix is just a group of numbers, and there are rules for doing things like multiplying them. In reality, there are programs like Excel that will do all of this for you. Even to use those, you need to know what to input. In our case, the matrix X is the collection of plus ones and minus ones above, just like this. While Y, the column matrix of yields for the 16 experiments, is this. If you do a linear regression to find the coefficients using just the primary variables in this case, uh, in other words, using this equation as the model, you get terrible statistics indicating you're missing a lot. Here's a screenshot of the statistics, which are, as stated, not good with an R squared equals 69%. For this type of thing, a 95% confidence interval is typically used, and if you look at the two columns with the upper and lower limits, you never want those to have different signs, which basically means your coefficient is zero within error. In order to improve the model, you start adding additional features like cross terms, such as temperature times time, which suggests the terms are interacting. In addition, the terms don't have to be linear, so you can see if terms like temperature squared are significant. If these terms are included, you curve the surface, which can lead to peaks or more often ridges. Basically, if there is a ridge due to, say, time squared, it might indicate that both too short and too long of a time decreases the yield. The maximum yield is near the top of the ridge. In order to satisfactorily model a curved surface, it's helpful to get some additional data like points right in the middle of the surface. In our case, with four variables, the center point is 0, 0, 0, 0. We can add axial points to the middle of the sides. These are significantly easier to show pictorially in fewer dimensions than the 4D problem Gunner was working with, and we did that in the previous video. For a flat surface in 2D, you can get the data you need by looking at the corners like this. If you're trying to figure out how the surface curves, you get data in the middle of the square and add axial points like this. The axial points are zero in every variable but one, in one variable for a two-level design like this, where you're measuring plus one and minus one for everything, the distance from the center should be the square root of the number of variables. For the two-variable problem in the last video, that's the square root of two, or about 1.4 from the center. So the axial points in the middle of the faces were zero plus 1.4. 
zero, negative 1.4, plus 1.4, zero, and negative 1.4, zero. Gunner had four variables, so his axial point should be the square root of four or a scale two away from the center. Unfortunately, that wasn't physically possible for some of the variables. Heating THF to 120 degrees C is no good, and the zinc reagent wasn't nearly soluble enough to get it to concentrations that high. So we just did axial points at plus one and minus one as well. The full design and the data he collected look like this. Several runs were done at the center to look at the repeatability of the experiments. Crucially, since you plan all at once, you can parallelize. Set up multiple vials, heat them together, analyze and batch. Gunner could repeat this kind of design in a day or two, unlike trying to do one variable at a time, which may take longer and not reach the optimum. To start, we add in every possible cross term and square term, then do a regression. Many of the terms are not significant and are dropped from the analysis. In this case, you end up with a relatively complex model that has all the primary terms, two cross terms, temperature and ratio and ratio time, along with one squared term, temperature squared. To get the entries in the matrix, you literally just multiply or square the primary terms. So if your temp on a run is plus one and your ratio is minus one, then temp times ratio equals plus one times minus one equals minus one. So the numbers in the time squared column we are literally just squaring the numbers under time. The matrix you run the regression on looks like this. Here's the model with 95% confidence limits on the parameters for this reaction. The first parameter, 72 plus or minus 7%, gives a yield with everything at zero for the model. The ratio of pyrrolide zinc to aryl bromide has the largest parameter, meaning it is important, and is positive, meaning more is better. You can't plot things in five dimensions, but you can pick three dimensions and plot those. Here's a plot of the surface related to the model, where the Z is equal to yield, X is equal to temperature, and Y is equal to the zinc pyrrolide to aryl bromide ratio. Here the axes are extended to plus 2 and minus 2, so you can see what would happen if you look just outside the model range. You can see the red ridge almost lined up with the Y axis. The ridge rises slightly as you increase the ratio. In the X temperature direction, it drops off rapidly if you get too hot or too cold. The temperature sits on the ridge at about zero, so we put our reaction temperature at 75 degrees C. Another interesting parameter in the model is time, which has a value that is pretty large and negative. This essentially means the shorter the better when it comes to the reaction time, so we used four hours. The published conditions ran at 100 degrees C for 44 hours. Our optimized conditions are 75 degrees C for just four hours to give a slightly better yield. Incidentally, the model predicts that you should get 96 plus or minus 7% yield at the optimal conditions, and we got 92% isolated yield. For the electron-rich substrate we examined, these are the optimized conditions. The model here is much simpler with only primary variables and only two of those, temperature and ratio. For this simple model, you can plot the whole flat surface and it looks like this. When trying to isolate paroles with electron-rich aromatics like this, there was an unidentified byproduct that was difficult to separate using the original conditions at 6 degrees C for 17 hours. The optimized conditions at a higher temperature for a shorter time give a higher yield and a cleaner product that is easily purified. Finally, the electron deficient airing reaction that was optimized retained all of the primary variables in one cross term, temperature times ratio. If there is a cross term, it twists the surface a bit, which you can hopefully see in this picture. The final model looks like this with a very large temperature coefficient asking for high temperatures for the reaction. These electron deficient reactions work better with dicyclohexyl biphenylphosphine, called Cyjonphos, in place of the tert butyl derivative. We run it at 100 degrees C in a sealed tube in THF for just six hours. The model suggests you should get 100% yield under the optimized conditions. Okay, it really says 101%, but let's not get greedy. Uh, we got 95% isolated yield. The final thing Gunner did was apply these conditions to some other substrates with various sterics and electronics. He used the optimized conditions for the electron-rich, electron-deficient, and sterically large, depending on the substrate, and got good yields across the board. In summary, to optimize reactions using this kind of procedure, screen variables OVAT style first to pick the important ones. The full factorial designs, you can use two levels per variable and scale them. 
run reactions in parallel and collect data, fit the model and prune insignificant terms, validate with a test run at the predicted optimum, and then win at synthesis. Thanks for watching this dive into real world response surfaces. We make these videos for fun and to give back to the community. Please subscribe, give us a thumbs up, and take a look at the rest of our playlists, which has videos at a variety of levels. Hit notifications so you don't miss anything because we drop videos only occasionally when we aren't in the lab. Thanks.